Um, okay, so um, we have the coronavirus, we have COVID-19, and we have um, uh, parents who are older. Um, and we, yeah, we're trying to get advice for what they should expect and what practical, practical things that they can do to actually mitigate or even minimize risk rather than just worrying or not caring. Yeah. So, um, the virus. So yes, and the, and the pandemic and what's going to be happening over the next couple of months. So what is happening and what is the timeline? Well, so now we're at, what is this, 18th of March? Yeah. Is that right? I think so. Uh, yeah, 18th of March, London. Uh, so we've got, what, about 500 cases confirmed in the UK? Last time I checked, it's probably a thousand by now because that was a day ago and it's 30% more cases a day plus they're doing a lot more testing. Uh, Chinese data that I saw suggested that there were about 12 times as many cases undetected as detected, which probably means we could be at 12,000 cases. London is 8 million people. So uh, what does that turn into? So 12,000 cases, a bit more than one person in a thousand is probably infected, say one in 600. Um, somebody was talking about this to this morning said, you know, what that means is it's one person per tube, but it's not yet one person per carriage. Mm. Uh, although hopefully the tube trains are running mostly empty. Um, so what the the important part of this is that right now our understanding is that this thing is doubling somewhere between once every three days and once every week because we don't have comprehensive effective infection control in the UK yet. So if it's one person 600 now, end of the week it might be one person 300, end of the week after that one person 150, after that, one person seventy-five. After that, it's really, really everywhere. Okay, so what we have is a, a, a virus that we currently don't really know how to treat, and it's doubling every three days. Three, three to six days. You know, and so the I mean, the important part about this is that we have practically no experience as human beings at any point in our history of something that predictably doubles very, very rapidly from you know a little threat off the horizon to everything is on fire. Yes. So any mental model that people build now, if they hang on to that model for 10 days, it's completely out of date. If they hang on to it for another 10 days, it's a total liability. Okay, so yeah, you've got lots of, uh, lots of awkward news um, opinion makers saying that the numbers are really low and the normal flu is much, much higher. And that's because that's the old world model of just we're looking at we, we think this flu is going to act like that flu, and the whole point is it's going to double, then double, then double, and double until we get exactly hundreds, thousands. Exactly. So the the epidemiologists talked of this, talk about this with a number called R. So R is if you have this thing on average, how many people catch it from you? Uh, R for a seasonal flu from memory is about one point three. So every person that catches the flu tends to give it to one and a third more people, and in a bad year it might be a little higher than that. Uh, I have seen estimates from COVID no lower than 2.8 and sometimes ranging as high as 6. So it's more than twice as infectious, possibly four times as infectious. Okay, so we talk about um, infectious how? You know, how, how likely, our best knowledge, how do people get it? How do you they pass it on? Okay, so here we begin to get to the real art and science of surviving these things. Um, the bad news is that the governments habitually lie in the early stages of pandemics for a wide variety of reasons. So the whole question of how is this thing transmitted is extremely politicized. Uh, you've seen, for example, tons of recommendations saying that ordinary people don't need to wear masks and shouldn't wear masks and all the rest of that stuff. And that is largely about attempting to persuade the public not to buy things so that the doctors can't get hold of them. So the hospitals have run out of masks because the governments were woefully underprepared they didn't have an adequate stockpile of masks, the hospitals didn't have a stockpile of masks, everybody had just in time delivery thinned out all of their reserves. So when the public start buying masks at an elevated rate, suddenly the mask supply chain goes dry and everybody turns around and asks as if this is the public fault, right? And it's clearly not the public's fault. Um, the fundamental truth is that if doctors who are treating coronavirus parent, patients were masks and gloves and face shields and all the rest of that rattle, they're doing that because it's the most effective way of keeping the damn thing off you. Mm -hmm. So and I, the what I'm trying to frame here is that you have to watch what the experts do rather than listening to what the talking heads on TV say. Now, 
This is not a skill that I expect to be teachable to the vast majority of the people who are in their 70s. There'll be a few who are mentally flexible and sharp and suspicious, but for the most part, people in their 70s are generally content to take the received wisdom and make small improvements on it. Mm -hmm. So it, you, what you have to do in terms of interpreting things is you have to understand that the actual situation and the situation as reported in the news will be substantially different all the way through the process. Um, even if they were completely, um, even if the reporters were completely honest and lovely, there will be a two or three day delay in their their knowledge, let's say. Um, so it's... Like the best it can be is out of date. So it will be out of date. They will tend to pick experts that are kind of middle of the pack, moderate, kind of average experts. The truth is very seldom to be found in average experts. Usually it's found in people that were on the ground at the first breakouts of these things. So if the Chinese or the Italians are freaking out, they've got way more data than the guy that they wheel out from an NHS hospital. Mm. It's because they've had six weeks more of exposure, they've actually seen piles of dead people in their corridors. So you constantly have to look at what's being said and then say, okay, what do the people on the front line say? What do the um, people that have nothing to lose say? So the World Health Organization tends to basically give it to you straight on the nose because they're not subject to political pressure from nation state governments in any direct way. Mm -hmm. World Health Organization are freaking out, right? You know, it, I mean, it's a very, um, it's a very nuanced skill trying to bias it. And this is not, this is not, you know, I'm not saying be conspiratorial, but, you know, generally speaking, the governments don't want to panic the public before they get measures in place. The news organizations will tend to pick middle of the old ec road experts. Nobody is going to really take to the mass media and say, by the way, in all probability, you know, one to four million Americans are going to die in the next 90 days and there's not really a lot we can do about it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just not the kind of thing that people in the news can say. So the news filter tends to be less apocalyptic than the actual situation is pretty consistently until they flip into the other gear and then they're vastly more apocalyptic and they're equally wrong in the other direction. So what this means is you have to have a very, very strong critical faculty when you're trying to piece together the actual story. And my advice to people is World Health Organization, uh, pay close attention to the stuff that's coming out from frontline doctors that have been dealing with it a month or two longer than our guys have. Uh, and, you know, always be on the alert for stories like, oh, the public don't need to wear masks. Well, could you explain to me why the public don't need to wear masks? Is that because the doctors are all wrong when they wear masks? And yes. you have to kind of compensate for this stuff. Okay. Um, so that's the so first that's, thing. Getting okay. to the truth is hard. And then the question is, when you make a mistake, which way do you are? Okay. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to is the uh, practical things. Um, let, let's say monitoring lots and lots of news feeds and trying to create an entire model out of a lot of imperfect data is probably something that not many people can do and not, not, even less people want to do. So then you go, I just can't deal with that, just tell me what to do. Okay, so the, the question that raised this was how does it spread? Yeah. Right. So the official doctrine right now is that the coronavirus is spread largely by touching things which have snot on them. Mm -hmm. Right. People who are infected cough on a surface, you then touch the surface with your hands, the virus then lives on your hands, the surface, uh, it will stay alive on the surface for three days is the current wisdom. Right. Less on cardboard, uh, much longer on surfaces like plastic and stainless steel, which is a bit unusual. Um, so, so just to emphasize, we're not sort of talking about little um, little airborne bugs. It's got, we don't think about little microscopic things. Well, but here's the question, yeah. right? So the initial take has always been you know, it's just stuck on surfaces. You just wash your hands with ordinary soap and water and everything will be fine. Stop buying hand sanitizer and stop buying masks. God damn it, right? So that story ran for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but then you start seeing lab reports of like, wait a minute, you know, this thing appears to be able to hang out in the air for days. Okay. So we're now seeing some reports that coronavirus is capable of transmitting fully airborne. Now, it's not very infectious in that form, we think. Right, But um, when you start seeing these kind of discrepancies between the early received wisdom and the stuff that's coming out of the labs, generally you want to pay attention to what's coming out of the labs. So this critically affects strategy. Because if it really was something that was only being picked up on hands and then you transfer it from your hands to your face, 
containment would be a lot easier. In mm -hmm. theory, if everybody washes their hands and stops picking their noses, the virus stops spreading. Mm -hmm. Weirdly enough, what we see in China is not that pattern, right? What we see in China is the pattern of everybody's locked indoors and people go outside. They go outside in masks and if they can, moon suits. Yeah. And you see a lot of pictures of Chinese people with five bottle liter, uh, 10 liter bottles sawn off, like the big water cooler bottles sawn off and worn over their heads. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they evolved those strategies because they were being superstitious. I think they evolved those strategies because it turns out that they'd had a lot of exposure to this thing and they were probably being pretty rational. So I think that what we're going to find is that it is substantially more infectious in the air than is currently thought to be. And this is the reading of the runes, right? This is, you take the best guess. And this is why I'm fundamentally very pro-mask, yes. right? Standard advice, government says, just wash your hands, don't wear masks. Hospitals are running out of masks because the government didn't have a mask reserve. And because the hospitals are so short of money that they haven't kept mask reserves themselves, government advice is somewhat self-serving. Stuff that seems to be coming out of the clinical setting makes it look like it's really infectious. So somebody coughs, you get a little splatter, it hangs around in the air maybe longer than people initially thought. Mm -hmm. And at this point in the progress of the story, we don't know for sure. So when you don't know for sure, you can either follow the received doctrine, which is just wash your hands, and hope that it's not also capable of hanging out in the air for a while. Or you can get a little suspicious and you can get a little paranoid and you can overreact a little on the basis that if you look a little dumb later, it was only a few t-shirts that you chopped up and put rubber bands on, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you are in the other direction, you've got problems. So my assertion here is that you always want to take with a pinch of salt what's coming out of the media and what's coming out of the governments. Try and stay close to the clinical data if you can. Try and listen to the World Health Organization, the doctors that have been up close to the thing. Okay, so uh, uh, on, if it seems a little bit like overreacting, it, that's okay. Um, embarrassment is not fatal. Yes. Coronavirus is. Yes. Right. And that, as a template for thinking about this thing, dying of embarrassment is only a, a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Is that the right word? Simile? Metaphor? Something like that. One uh, of those words. It's, it's a metaphor. Metaphor, let's, right? Let's, 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 yeah. Let's. Well, you're a writer. You tell me it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor. I could be, uh, yeah, I'm a writer, yeah. I just made it up. Oh, there we are. Carry on. So, dying of embarrassment, you know, is is not a thing that you can do really, but dying of coronavirus is. So, my recommendation is overreact a little. So, what this means is we have to assume that it spreads on surfaces because we've got really strong evidence of that. We have to have some suspicion that it spreads a little more easily in there than we think. And we have to do things that we can sustain for a long time because current understanding is we're going to be living with this thing for a year. Um, yeah, we'll have to get into the timeline of ups and downs and things coming back. Phases and summer and all the rest of that. We'll talk about that. So what this comes down to is multi-tiered approaches for not getting sick, right? And here we could cut through all the complexity and say, look, the job is that you want to separate the human beings from the viruses. Mm -hmm. And if the humans and the viruses stay apart, the humans do fine and the viruses die out. And that's your top line, right? The viruses, we know they can stick to surfaces for a long time. We know if somebody coughs on you, it will stick to you. It will also potentially get directly inhaled. If it gets into your eyes, nose or mouth, it spreads very rapidly through your respiratory system. If it stops high up in your lungs or in your throat, you're okay. If it spreads into your lower lungs, you're screwed. So if your body fights it off before it gets to your lower lungs, you generally have very mild symptoms. If your body doesn't fight it off until it gets into the bottom of the lungs and right at all the little fringy bits where the air is exchanged, then you're really hosed. Um, yes, so far the statistics are if it gets to that stage. You know, because everyone's talking about how deadly it is and what the percentages is. But mm. When it gets to that stage, the survival rate becomes uh, very low. What, 50-50? And right, that's actually better than I thought. Yeah. But that's pretty nasty. It's pretty nasty, right? You, yeah, you're tossing a coin on the life. It's not good. And, I mean, the, the level of impact here is, I would say, sort of think of, like, for old people in the, develop, in the developed world, if this thing goes wildly, fully pandemic, which is the current uh, situation in, say, Italy, it's going to hit old people about as hard as AIDS hit gay people in the 1980s. Mm. Right, we're talking about something which will there will be before and there will be an after, and it will take an enormous notch out of a generation. Um, AIDS disproportionately hit the young and the strong, and the fabulous and the creative, 
Um, uh, you know, I mean, Maplethorpe, imagine what Maplethorpe would have done if he'd gotten another 30, 40 years. You know, like there are huge lights that went out with AIDS. Um, this thing, on the other hand, tends to disproportionately hit the old. So the kind of Stuart Brands and Kevin Kellys of the world will be greatly missed if this thing takes them out. But we're losing people for the most part at the end of their careers. So it's a different kind of crisis to AIDS, mm. right? But the bottom line is that if you're in your 60s, 70s, or even 80s, this thing is a super deep existential threat in a way that it isn't if you're a teenager. And that's quite unusual for diseases. They tend to basically, you know, there tends to be a kind of linear decrease in damage by age. But in this thing, it's like nothing, 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 nothing. Ooh, that's a bit dodgy. Boom, you're all going to die. Uh, 15, 20% mortality for people in their 70s. It's yeah. really super rough. And then it goes down to less than a percent, uh, I don't know, in, 30, in your 30s or 20s or something. In your, in your 40s, yeah. it's about 1.3%. Mm. Uh, below 40, I, th I believe that we haven't had a single child under the age of nine die. Yeah. Uh, and teenagers, they're pretty tough. Um, so it's unusual, right? Mm. Um, 1918 flu, which a lot of people will have heard of, tended to kill people in their 20s and 30s. The very young and the very old weren't touched. That's part of why that hit so hard. So the, the thing that I'm trying to frame here is this. The clinical data is lagging behind the situation and countermeasures that are relatively cheap, relatively effective and relatively sustainable ought to be done using our good old magic phrase, out of an abundance of caution. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep the bugs away from the people. So the first thing that we do is we keep the people away from the people because we know that we can't tell who's infected and who isn't. Okay, so um, uh, social distancing or isolation? Uh, social distancing, isolation. Well, then, uh, then uh, spend 30 seconds on social distancing. Uh, when does it work? Okay. You know, when is like, I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the half measures where you sort of do something, but it makes no difference. No at difference all. at all. When does it start making a difference? So social distancing, or what does my friend Lucas call it? Lucas calls it um, contact, uh, contact minimization, contact, contract reduction. So there are two sides of this. There's what works for the population as a whole, and there's what works for you individually. So in Japan, they have a more or less entirely no-touch culture. The Japanese are, to put it mildly, not huggers. Hmm. Whereas the Italians are you know, typically three kisses on the face at first greeting for total strangers. Yes. So the way that it's ripped through Italy in the long run, I think, is likely to come down to the fact that the Italians have really small default social distance and the Japanese have a much larger default social distance. They also do things like close schools early and they would tend to wear masks when they're sneezing and all the rest of this sort of stuff also adds to it. But just that basic fact of people are kind of staying away from people does somewhat dampen down the speed of infection in the population as a whole. Mm. So this is the level of kind of casual social distancing of like we don't hug, we don't shake hands, everybody washes their hands a lot. And it's this sort of ambient awareness of like, you know, okay, maybe we're going to be a little careful with this. That approach will slow the spread in the general population down a little bit. But if you're 70 and this thing is 15% likely to kill you if you catch it, this is Russian roulette, mm. right? If you were in uh, immunosuppressed in an intensive care ward already, right, if you'd had like a liver transplant and you were 15% likely to die if you caught a cold, they'd literally put you in an isolation chamber, right? Yes. I mean, there would be massive clinical precautions because if you caught something, you were 15% likely to die and that would considered be an absolute peril to life and limb and they would take it accordingly. Mm. So if you're over 70, on the clinical date available, it looks like it's about 15% fatal. So you have to look at pretty much any contact with other human beings as a loaded gun. Mm. Not comfortable, really not comfortable, not good for people, not safe at any speed, bad for people psychologically, huge actual practical problems. But this is sort of what the data seems to be saying right now. So let's go back to this model, right? Social, keeping the people and the virus apart. Social distancing keeps the people and the people apart because we can't reliably tell who's infected and not yet. Yeah. Then if the virus is in the environment not attached to a human being, you need to keep it away from you. And then if it's in something like the air, you need to keep it away from you and you need to stop people bringing it into your story. So it's kind of a multiple level system. So staying away from people, right? You just don't go to public events. You don't go to the shops. 
You don't go to church. You don't go to concerts. You don't go to the pub. You don't do a damn thing. You stay at home because nobody in your house has it. And if they do, you're already you're already infected. Yes. <clears throat> Anytime you go outside, any of the people around you could be infected. Now, this is where the probabilities get real important. Right now, let's say that we've got one in, say, 500 people infected in London. Yeah, this is the 18th of March. 18th of March. So you go into a pub in London, and you say, okay, there are 200 people who've been through this pub today. Mm -hmm. So there's about a one in two chance that one of them will have been infected. It's a bit less, 40%. And maybe there's a 10% chance that that person will have coughed or sneezed on something which is going to infect you if you touch it. And then there's another small percentage you're going to rub your eye and it's going to get into your face. And then there's another small percentage that will die of it. Right. Two weeks from now, that will have gone from sort of a 40% chance to a 100% chance. Mm. So you need to start building the mental model of everything outside is dangerous and contaminated until we know otherwise. Mm. And even though that is an overreaction today, if the thing is doubling every three to six days, then, you know, one in a thousand, one in five hundred, one in two hundred and fifty, one in one hundred and twenty five, one in sixty four, one in thirty two, one in sixteen, one in eight. Right? The government says right now that more than half of the UK population are going to get this thing. So it's going to go one in eight, one in four, one in two. Now, as you get towards one in two, the infection begins to slow down. Firstly, because many of the people that the virus jumps to already have it. Secondly, um, because the mass public freaking out will tend to keep people away from each other in the way that we saw in China. Yes. So in the UK, we did a really good job of catching the government when they were about to accidentally kill half a million people by announcing that we were just going to ride this thing out and everybody should sneeze on their healthy, young, fit neighbours. Yes. What did they call that again? Um, uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity. Right. Herd immunity in the same way that people used to herd mammoths off cliffs to eat them. Um, I mean, really, the, the thing that hit me hardest about that was some American epidemiologist saying that when they first heard it, they thought it was the onion. Yes, they thought it was a joke, so, uh, a, a, a satire, yeah. satire piece of, of no one would be so stupid no or evil to do this. Yeah, and it just turns out they got bad data. They got bad advice from their scientists, and the bad advice from the scientists turned to bad advice for the public. Yeah. This stuff really matters. Like, you know, the actual clinical epidemiology stuff, like where you're on the front end, you know, advising governments on what will or won't get their populations killed, that's a really harsh job. Um, so, this, this model of rapid acceleration into a condition where the entire outside environment has to be treated as contaminated, mm -hmm. think of this as being like people are immunocompromised in an ICU. Right, you've had a transplant, they've got you filled with things to stop your body rejecting the transplant. If you catch a cold, you're going to die. Think of the kind of precautions that you see. Mm. Doctors are in moon suits, people are in isolation wards, nobody's allowed inside, you check people's temperatures, you know, people are talking to each other through glass plates. Yeah, and moon suits is a, not a technical term, but it just means completely covered, head to toe, absolutely no air in, right. sealed. Sheet of plastic, mask, face guard. Now, you sort of think, but surely this is an overreaction. Well, 15% fatal in people over 70. So if we handle risks that severe in hospitals using those kind of measures, unfortunately, people have to start taking this thing roughly that seriously because that's roughly how much risk they're at. Yes. Right? Uh, I, certainly, I have grown up in a world that has almost no risk in it. Um, uh, Western people, <clears throat> English people, the environment does not kill you particularly yeah. um, and we've mitigated most of the medical risks so I certainly am not used to know how to deal with suddenly there is now risk in the environment like being in Africa or Southeast Asia where there'd be malaria or dirty water or something yeah absolutely it's just it's an environment with more risk in it now uh, I saw a woman that had grown up in Jamaica saying you know what she realized was that a whole bunch of the things that were normal life to her when she was a kid mm -hmm. are now pandemic control She's like, yeah, we used to put all of our fruit and vegetables, you know, in a bucket with a little, you know, a cap full of dental and leave it to soak for a while before we ate it. Mm. Like that was normal. You know, I didn't realize that I was living in a disaster zone. <laughs> and that was her words, not mine. I'm paraphrasing slightly, but I mean, it was a, it was a very clear thing for her. You know, that it was like, oh, I grew up in these conditions. I hadn't realized that that's because I grew up in a place that was super dangerous. Mm. 
So I want to go back to this core model, right? Very, very rapid spread. The outside world becomes contaminated very, very, very quickly. It might be safe today. I'm certainly treating it as safe-ish today. But, you know, today is the day that I'm going to shave off my beard. And after that, I'm not going outside without a mask, mm -hmm. right? I'm 50. I've got slightly questionable lungs. I would say if I get the thing, I am probably 5 to 10% likely to die if I don't get efficient medical care. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the NHS will necessarily be there when I need it because they'll be treating people that are in more much trouble than I would be in. Yes. So, so that's, uh, that's the a timeline thing that I want to come back to is uh, the, the immediate crisis and yes. how it moves across the years. Anyway. Absolutely, right. So this... Um, I'm trying to get this exactly right. So this approach of you treat the world as being more dangerous than it is because it will shortly be that dangerous mm -hmm. gives you time to practice. Yes. So the mental model is it is as if you're an immunocompromised patient on a ward that hasn't been cleaned properly and is filled with bugs. So rather than the doctors wearing the moon suits to visit you, you're wearing moon suits to visit the doctors. Mm -hmm. So the first answer is don't come into contact with human beings, then you don't need a moon suit. Mm. See how simple that is? Yeah. Right. Now, if you're 25, this advice is ridiculous because if you're 25, if you catch the thing, it's not going to kill you. But then we say, but if you catch the thing, then you might give it to somebody else. Yeah. So you have to be careful. But the practical truth is that I don't expect the vast majority of 25 year olds to act as if this is their problem. Mm. It would be great if they did. It would be wonderful if you were the kind of human beings that did that. It'd be wonderful if the government got on top of it and handled it properly. But the bottom line is, I think that there will be a whole bunch of people taking a whole bunch of dumb risks in their 20s and 30s because they're not really affected by the downside. And that's a generation that does a lot of things like drunk driving. So old people and their, uh, you know, kind of allies, right, relatives mostly, are largely responsible for managing the contagion risk to old people themselves. Because I don't think you can count on large scale social coordination to really cover this properly. So... Firstly, stay away from other human beings. Stay at home because home is safe. Then there's the question of, well, how do we eat, right? Mm -hmm. How do we see our grandchildren and so on? Right now, this is two problems. Staying in social contact with people, it's just going to have to be the internet, right? This might mean getting parents, you know, a working uh, tablet or a better phone or getting them set up on the software or getting one of those dreadful Facebook doohickeys or whatever it happens to be, you know, you want some sort of technical measures to help people keep in contact. And then you want to use that stuff as part of the infection control. Because if grandma gets, um, you know, sad and lonely and depressed and decides just this once she's going to go and see her friend uh, Edith, then what's going to happen is it sh either she kills Edith or Edith kills her if either one of this, them is infected. Mm. So you have to consider meeting people's social and emotional needs as being part of infection control because people being reasonably comfortable and happy is what keeps them at home and what keeps them at home is what keeps them safe. Mm. Now is an excellent time to teach these folks how to use Netflix if they're not using it already. There are many wonderful, enormously long series, you know, I mean if they're in their 70s they could start by re-watching the whole of Star Trek the original series which will make them feel like they're in their 20s and then there's another uh, 17,000 hours of TV to catch up on there. Yes. Right? I mean, you could watch four hours of Star Trek a day for four years and not run out. Um, or, or things that nerds, not nerds like. I have no idea what you're talking about. The point is that there's everything. On, there, there's everything. There's, there's really, yeah, there's something for everyone. There's a bunch of stuff on iPlayer as, to, on, as well if people don't uh, have the ability to pay. But you sort of have to think of this as like it's going to hit old folks really hard. And the other thing is that, you know, like we're pretty used to the idea that we are going to talk to our parents on, you know, the internet thinger. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily all that well set up to talk to their friends. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, one older relative tends to talk to her kids using Facebook and another one tends to talk to her kids using, say, FaceTime, mm -hmm. these things are not interoperable. So just managing the address books so that your older relatives can actually connect to the people they want to talk to is probably a big part of making sure that they don't slip into social isolation. Mm. And if this is done well, I think that there is a decent chance that they're going to actually spend more time and be less isolated than they were before. Because, you know, they and all their friends have nothing to do but sit at home and talk to each other and watch TV. Mm -hmm. Well, 
okay, let's make it possible for them to do this because this all keeps them out of the environment, keeps them out of the community. So these are the social needs that make people break quarantine. Then you've got the business, the practical business of food and stuff, right? So delivery currently runs pretty well. Chinese experience seems to be that the delivery mechanism stayed pretty clean and didn't pass on a lot of infection. Uh, as long as that continues to be true, food gets delivered. The smart thing to do here is rather than having a whole bunch of fuss about decontaminating boxes when it arrives and you know all the rest of these kind of relatively technical measures that you might take, mm -hmm. the sensible thing to do is to leave the stuff for, let's be conservative and say four days, untouched. Right? Mm -hmm. So delivery person comes, you're going to have to get the stuff inside of the house, so that's a possible moment of contamination. But then rather than unpacking everything immediately and putting it on the shelves and disinfecting it and wiping it and spraying it and all the stuff that you might want to do, if you just leave it for four days, all available data says the virus will die on all of the surfaces. And it's probably as little as 24 hours for almost all of them. So the idea that you get the food and you just leave it in the delivery boxes or bags for days works if the things inside are non-perishable. Yes. Right? If they're perishable and you have to deal with them immediately, now you have a contagion problem, which is what if the person in the shop sneezed on this stuff before they put it into the bag? Mm -hmm. And it's not very likely. We didn't see a lot of it in China, but you know, you kind of do the math. This is 15% likely to kill me if I catch it. There's a one in 200 chance that somebody sneezed in this bag. Is that an acceptable risk? Mm -hmm. So you take 15, right? You divide it by one in 200. So 15 divided by 100 becomes what 0.15 it's roughly uh you know one sixth of a percent um divide again a third of a percent so that means there's a one in 300 chance that opening this box will kill you or maybe it's one in 1200 but wherever it is if you had a, you know if you were rolling like if you were playing russian roulette with a thousand chamber gun mm -hmm. you spin the chamber once you point at your head you pull the trigger and it either kills you or it doesn't nobody is going to do that Yes. Nobody in the right mind is going to take a one in a thousand chance of getting killed so they can have a pork chop. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly the sort of situation that old people are going to be in when this thing reaches full population penetration. Yes. So you have to start thinking, you know, there's a moment of existential risk when the food is delivered. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure that four weeks from now, there'll be a bunch of protocols that have been figured out by delivery people to make sure they don't pass contagion. But right now, all they're really doing is dumping the stuff at your door and running away. Mm -hmm. So that handoff process, some of that can be done by the old folks managing the situation. Some of that has to be done by the delivery people. Mm -hmm. So if the delivery people are masked and gloved and the goods are carefully handled and we're checking that people aren't infected and all the rest of that stuff, the goods should arrive without any contagion on them. If the stuff arrives and it's definitely contaminated, it's going to contaminate everything it touches, it's going to contaminate you, it's going to contaminate you of your fridge. So this approach of leave the stuff at the door, right, you know, kind of throw a blanket or something, or not blanket, would you use shower curtain, plastic sheet, something like that, mm -hmm. right? Throw something over it so that if there is anything on it, it can't go off onto anything else and leave it for four days. That is good and safe. Things which you want to eat immediately are things which have to be refrigerated. This is the point where you're going to be talking about spraying things down with a bleach solution. My guess is 5% bleach. It might be 1% bleach. I don't think we've got clinical data. You might want to over bleach it to be sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then you leave it for a while and then you put it away. Right, frozen stuff. Um, freezing will not kill the virus reliably. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're in a position where you just put the frozen stuff into the freezer in a bag, mm -hmm. you don't handle it. You then go and wash your hands. Your risk should be minimised. Better still gloves. Right. Yes. But so you, you put it in the freezer, leave it for a week. It'll die out, not from the cold, but just from just from time. Just from time. Right? And it'll probably die faster because of the cold, but again, we don't have reliable clinical data. Yes. So much of this, you're going to hear me over and over and over again guessing. So, so yeah, again, it's a, it's a, it's a new virus, and, and the, the, the big problem is we're just humans, and society does not know how to deal with it yet. That's our, right. our immunosystem does not know how to deal with it. We're not geared up. We're and new. 
if the delivery people are really, really well organized and careful and tested and all the rest of that stuff, this process will become increasingly safe. Mm -hmm. But right now, the sort of dynamics of getting food delivery, if you're in the risky demographic, are like the dynamics of people exchanging German spy, uh, spy or not German spies, Russian spies over the bridges in Berlin during the Cold War. Mm. Right? It's like you have a lot of risk and you have to you know, carefully negotiate the risk as this stuff arrives. Then you say, well, what would be the easiest way of doing this? Why don't the kids go and take the food? Mm -hmm. right? And the kids handling the food deliveries or going out and buying the food or whatever it happens to be, all of the same stuff about leaving things for days is perfectly fine. That's a good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But in the you know two hours of the visit where you go and you take the food and you unpack it and you put it on the shelves and you see how people are doing and you sit down and you have a cup of tea, if you're infected, they're infected. Yeah. Right? So then you start talking about, well, do I go around and, you know, arrive and, like, I wear a mask and a gloves and they wear a mask and a gloves and we sit six feet apart from each other and we talk to each other? Mm -hmm. Sounds hard. Mm -hmm. Really sounds hard. I mean, you know, it's almost like prison visits. Yes. And I think that people are going to find that very emotionally difficult, but there'll be situations where that's the right way to do it. And unfortunately, the bottom line situation is that they are inside of your protective envelope. Mm -hmm. So if you follow those procedures carefully, you don't kill your parents. And if you don't follow those procedures carefully, you do kill your parents. And even if you do follow them carefully, there's always some risk. Yes. Right? So we don't know exactly what the deal is with aerosols yet. Yeah. Right? So you mask up, you glove up, you don't see any people, but you take an elevator down, like we have an elevator here. Then you arrive at destination, you take all your stuff off and you come in and you meet and then you go out and you put all your stuff on again. If the thing is aerosol, it might have gotten onto your clothes in the elevator, you know, it sticks to your socks, rubs off on the car, right? And the, the terrible sadness in all this is that some people will be left with the guilt of wondering whether they killed their parents because their parents got it and died. And it actually turns out that, you know, they just went out in the backyard and talked to their neighbor over a fence and their neighbor was infectious but had no symptoms. Their neighbor recovered without ever having even really a sniffle, but that's where the point of infection was. Mm. So, you know, it's very, very, very hard to teach people that other people are now threats. And this is the truth. Other people are threats. You see the pictures of the Chinese in the middle of the epidemic. They're terrified of each other. Mm. You can see the fear in the eyes of the people who are outside in their masks and their improvised helmets. You know, that's because they'd figured out that other people are now threats and not benefits. Very, very scary, right? And again, you can't see this on the streets now because we're at one in a thousand infected. Mm -hmm. One in a thousand becomes one in a hundred in maybe 10 days. One in a hundred becomes one in 10 in maybe another 10 days. This thing is amazingly fast. Maybe it takes six weeks rather than three. But this is the sort of environment that we're in right now. And all we can really do is overreact early, practice, get realistic models of what's going on, put pressure on the government to protect us as best as it's able. But even with the best will in the world, I mean, have you seen that um, the newspaper video in Italy where it's just page after page after page after page of obituaries? Yes. The Italians are not stupid people, mm -hmm. right? They've got an excellent medical service. They're intelligent. They're educated. North Italy is practically Austria. The people are pretty careful and... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, precise. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about places that have hundreds of years of you know culture and art and science and medicine, and they got whacked, absolutely whacked. Um, and if it can happen in Italy, it can happen anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Really, really tricky. Then you look at places like Singapore; they got it under control. So what I'm trying to communicate here, and this is a big ask for a general audience. What I'm trying to communicate here is you start having to treat the world as a red zone, mm. right? The world becomes a place like movies. Oh, I went outside. I might have picked up the bug. I can't come inside because I might kill all of you. Oh my God, we have a problem, right? And that sort of thinking seems like something out of a horror movie. The virus is not that dangerous to the majority of the population on current data. Even if it kills 1%, you know... 1% of people in their 40s, if they get it, that's probably mostly people that have pre-existing lung issues or they're immunocompromised. 
people in their 30s, the mortality drops even from there. So for most of those people, you make a containment error, it's very unlikely to directly harm you. If you are not infected, it's not going to harm anybody else. If you are infected, you stay at home and you notice you were contaminated, it's okay. But for the old folks, you know, it really is like being inside of some awful Hollywood disaster film. Mm. And communicating that to people like, you know, mom and dad, World War II has broken out and the enemy is using biological weapons. And you guys are super at risk because you've got a well, one in six chance of dying. Russian roulette is one in six. Mm. You know, you go outside, you get this thing, we spin the gun, we figure out whether you live. And that's if the hospitals have enough beds. If they don't have enough beds, the mortality could be way higher. So the gravity of this, I mean, I adapted relatively quickly because I spent so much time working on pandemics 10 years ago that I have a mental model of what exponential spread looks like and I have a mental model of if you sneeze, you get sneezed on, you die, right? I, have, I, have a, I already have a morbid phobia of the elevator. Right. I don't think I'm going to start going up 10 flights of stairs to get here, but you know, I have a morbid pho phobia of the elevator. Oh my god, the elevator is, is a death trap. Uh, is that rational or not rational? We're not going to know for three months. Okay. This is really grim, isn't it? Mm. Right. Well, you like horror movies. Uh, now you get to star in one. Not sure my parents do. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I mean, that is laying out <clears throat> in, in as, in as uh, uh, simple blank, you know, uh, uh, enough terms of just like, these are the threats, this is what mm -hmm. is, is coming down the line, it's going to happen yeah. full on in three weeks or so. So that practical business, right, the food delivery happens at the door and there has to be a protocol at that point where you don't get contaminated, mm -hmm. right? If that's all that you do, everything is fine, mm -hmm. right? We stay at home, we watch Netflix, we spend an enormous amount of time annoying our grandchildren by making them play checkers with us. Uh, you know, granddad has decided that he's going to get his electrical guitar out of the attic because he was a big deal in the 1970s. And, you know, one way or the other, people just slowly go insane at home and that's fine, right? Yes. Now let's talk about how people really get killed in these situations. Mm -hmm. They really get killed trying to help people. Mm -hmm. They really get, get killed taking advantage of opportunities that require them to take a little risk. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know. So and so has just gotten a big old shipment of hand sanitizer, and I'm going to walk over there because it's only a quarter mile, and I'm going to get some of the hand sanitizer. And I'm going to come back, right? And if you don't have the mask and the gloves and a plastic poncho to put over your clothes, and you you know take your boots off at the door and you go through step by step, taking off all the equipment, and you don't contaminate your mask and you do all that stuff, and I'll talk through those protocols a little more carefully in a minute, then. You know, you get to the corner shop and you see your friend Bill who's walking in the opposite direction. You stop and have a three minute conversation. Something on the outside of you gets contaminated because Bill is ill and then you track it into the house with you and everyone dies. Right? It's, it's those little chance moments of interruption in procedure and protocol where people put the social norm above the clinical reality that you've trained doctors and nurses out of over a period of years, which is the difference between good hospital staff and murderers. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like clinical malpractice, right? I did something stupid, I broke the protocol, I tracked in an infection, then I killed half a ward. Clinical malpractice. So the situation that we're in is we have to acquire a whole bunch of the skills that doctors and nurses have for working around infection in order to protect ourselves. The first one of those skills is stick to the procedure even when it's socially awkward. Mm. And that single rule, if there was one thing that I was going to get people to take out of this, stick to the procedure even when it's socially awkward. I could get killed in this situation. I am not going to do that. Right? And carrying the awareness of I could get killed in this situation and I'm not going to do that is incredibly difficult on people. Yes. It's really, really socially hard. So what we have to do is largely take that responsibility for the old people that we care for. Mm -hmm. Right? You all stay at home with the Netflix, I will bring you food. Now the responsibility for maintaining that clinical barrier is on you, because as long as they stay home, you're the person that maintains the infection boundary. Mm -hmm. See how this works? Mm -hmm. They have to do their part, you have to do your part. Now you, who are younger and stronger and have more access to information, are the one carrying the burden. Mm -hmm. This is not good news for anybody. I am, uh, I mean, you know, 
this sounds like a weird thing to say, but my parents are both dead, and if they were alive, it would be really fortunate that they were both medical and understood how to do this stuff. Yes. You know, my mother handled chicken, you know, like like it was an active infection risk and did like, you know, a whole bunch of very weird things that it was years until I realized that most people handle chicken as if it was fruit and then wash their hands. Because my mother would handle it with like sterile technique as if it was poison until it was cooked. Like, wow. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit more about the practical model, right? Right now, it's not obvious to people from the news that the outside world is dangerous and contaminated. As it becomes more visible, a lot of people will find these adaptations much easier. But if you start now, you get practicing in an environment where when you make a mistake, it's much less likely to kill you. Once people are well warned by the outside world that this is a bad situation, it will be easier to get them to do compliance. But if they haven't started practicing, they're going to make a bunch of mistakes in the early stages, as I myself am making right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, <clears throat> so walking people through that process is very important and very delicate, right? It has to be done quite carefully, right? And if it's not done quite carefully, you hit problems. Mm -hmm. um, now let's talk about the other angle on this. What do you do about people that just won't comply, mm -hmm. right? Grandma, grandpa, whatever it is, they look at the situation, they say, oh, well, I don't think it's that bad, you know, Dunkirk spirit, or even worse, well, if it's my time to go, I'll go, mm -hmm. right? This is a really hard case, right? The people that are stubbornly sure that, you know, if it's their time, they'll go, or the people who are just like, well, I've lived long enough, maybe it's my time, or the people who are just like, I'm not going to give up my, you know, pint with my mates just because of this goddamn virus because, you know, I will live through World War II and I'm not going to let some sneeze kill me. Right? All of that sort of stuff, you have to decide whether you're willing to take away people's freedom for their own good when they're in their 70s. Hmm. Right? You know, you are 68, you've had a good life, we want you around and we're not going to let you do that, which is why I've taken your car keys. Right? Yeah, are we really strong. are we really gonna have those fights inside of families? Mm -hmm. Are we really gonna do that? Or is it gonna be a whole bunch of emotional blackmail and manipulation as we try and get people to do what's good, not just for them, but also for us? Yeah. Because if they go and get contaminated and then we have to go and care for them, now we gotta figure out whether we're tracking it back to all of our other relatives or we're gonna die ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you're in your fifties and your parents are in their eighties. You know, you are at risk if they're at risk. If they require nursing care and the hospitals are screwed, you're going to be in a position where there is infection all over everything for the rest of this process. You see what I'm saying? Herd immunity applies to old people actually complying with procedures and protocols and being safe as much as it applies to anybody else. Hmm. Right? So do, do you sort of see the world model? Because what I'm trying to communicate is a perspective on how life works. The whole world becomes an infectious disease ward. Yes. Right. Now, we are not all going to manage that all the time. There are going to be a bunch of exceptions. I am very worried that teenagers are very quickly just going to break free of the leashes completely, and that's going to be a huge social issue. But communicating to your parents, look, the whole world is an infectious disease ward, and you are the patients who are at risk. And we need to basically treat this as a medical situation. I think that's got the best chance of getting through to people. Uh, people can picture uh, a ward in, in a hospital. Yeah. But they know what happens. And, you know, they've all seen medical dramas where they had some immunocompromised patient and all the doctors and nurses were in moon suits. Or they've seen contagion. They've seen the CDC guys in the rubber mask. And what you have to explain is, like, look, because you're old, this thing affects you as badly as Ebola affects normal people. Normal people, younger people. Oops, sorry guys, right? But you know, if you communicate to people like, look, this is basically Ebola for old people. That's about the level of mortality that we're talking about for old people. Mm. Wow, that's bad, right? It's like, it's like, you know, like, okay, right, now I understand why we're freaking out. Oh boy. Right? So if you think of it as something that spreads as easily or more easily than Ebola, spreads far more easily than Ebola, but it's only Ebola level dangerous for people that are already old or immunocompromised or with bad lung problems, that's the kind of mental model to carry around. Yes. Right? And two weeks from now, we'll have much better ways of explaining this. But you know, if you wonder why I've been quite so gung ho in the past two weeks about just having a good old freak out and really strapping in, 
this is why. Yes. So, practical measures, right? Nothing is better than staying away from the virus. If you have to be in contact with the virus, then now we're in a position where it's gone from like, you know, hiding behind a battlement and the peasants are just throwing rocks mm -hmm. to close combat with a lethal opponent inside of your personal space. Yes. Right? Now, instead of having 40 feet between me and my front door, which protects me from viruses, and the postman knocks on the door, weaves packages, you know, I, you know, basically drag them inside with a broom and then shove them in the corner of the hallway and that's all we see of them for four days. Mm -hmm. It goes from being that sort of a situation to, you know, I am going to be in direct contact. I have to go to the shops because I live 300 miles away from my kids. How am I going to go to the shops to buy food to not and not get contaminated? If you live in an area with no delivery for food mm -hmm. and you have to physically go because the government has not organized delivery, or you're dealing with some idiot friend who's the only person you can rely on to get food and they're gonna just bustle their way into your kitchen and put all the stuff on shelves for you, and you lack the will to just be like, no, you cannot pass, you shall not come inside my house, you could kill me by doing this. Oh, but I'm just a hair maver. You've all seen that archetype, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in a position where you are dealing with, you know, the beast is at close quarters, you've got two basic plans of attack. The first is, it stays outside of your body because it's on plastic. Mm -hmm. This is the poncho, raincoat, you know, galoshes, hat kind of an approach. Um, and then you have gloves and you have careful hand washing. So you put on the closest thing you can get to a moon suit. You interact with the threat, like going to the shops or wherever it is. Then you come back. The hard part is getting the stuff off safely. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're lucky enough that you're living with somebody, they can have a sprayer of alcohol, but don't set yourself on fire. Better still, a little bit of bleach. Uh, again, I think 5%, maybe 1%, but a dilute solution of bleach, which they put into a hand sprayer and they just spray down your plastic sheeting before you take it off. They spray your gloves, they spray your poncho, they spray your hat, and you take the stuff off. This is pretty safe. Right? It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, I am a big fan of uh, what they call face shields, which are those plastic plates that people have in front of their faces. You see them all on, like, again, medical dramas. Uh, I have not tried this yet, but I'm pretty sure from the measurements and the materials that you could get a pretty good face shield out of a baseball cap, a two-liter soda bottle, a pair of scissors, and some tape. That's an experiment that I'm going to try or have a friend of mine try and just make sure that it works. Mm -hmm. The bottom part of the face shield will tend to curl around. The Chinese approach seems to be um, that you leave the bottom of the bottle on. Mm -hmm. So you cut off the top of the bottle, you leave the bottom on. You basically tape the front of the top of the bottle to the front of the baseball cap. I think you might have to trim the baseball cap. This is a bunch of experimentation that needs done. But the face shields are still fairly widely available. Mm -hmm. You can still buy these things on Amazon. Um, and if you have to improvise with a clear plastic bag rather than a sheet of, you know, bottle, it would be just as safe. So spray down the exterior, let it dry, take the stuff off carefully, make a note of what's inside and outside. You have to go in order. Much better for somebody else to help you take the stuff off once it's been sprayed, right? Because what you don't want is a position where, you know, you take off your gloves first then you handle your face shield or you handle your mask and the outside of the mask is contaminated because you can't just spray the mask with chlorine while you're wearing it, mm -hmm. right? So you have to treat the outside of the mask as contaminated and take it off with the gloves. So you kind of spray the gloves, then you take off the mask, right? <laughs> then you spray the gloves again because the gloves will take a lot of spraying and the mask, and your eyes and the mask won't. This is why the face shields are so good. They reduce the chance anything gets onto your skin. Mm -hmm. All of this is the same kind of procedural stuff that doctors and nurses do. I'm expecting there to be a bunch of really good explainer videos that show people how to do this in a bunch of detail coming out real soon now. There must be any number of people making these things. Mm -hmm. But the mindset is the important part, right? Um, and you see how this sounds like an enormous pain in the ass? Like it's really, really difficult and it sounds kind of dangerous? Yeah. Yeah, that's because it's really difficult and it is kind of dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you want to minimize the amount you're doing it. Right. I mean, I have the office down there. It's 300 yards of open road. 
and then two floors without much time in corridors to the building. But there is no doubt in my mind that I'm going to come in contact with viral particles out there that I wouldn't come in contact in here. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that's also where all my whiteboards are, and it's where my big computer is, and it's where my printer is, and it's where all the thinking happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the kind of calculated risk of like, Am I gonna, you know, how long am I gonna use that facility versus deciding I'm writing it off? Or am I just gonna get good enough at moon suit protocol that I'm comfortable with the risk going down there? Mm -hmm. Probably the latter. Um, largely because I feel like if I don't at least occasionally go out into the real world, you know, suit it up, I'm just gonna have lost contact with reality. Now, is that destructive vanity or is that me taking appropriate risks because actually the risk is minimal because procedurally I'll be pretty careful? Mm. And the answer is, Hard to say, it depends whether I get it and die. If I didn't get it and I don't die, all good. If I get it and I don't die, that's not such a bad outcome. Um, but you, you see that even I'm having to do that calculus. Yes. So everybody is embedded in this calculus, whether they know it or not. And that is super, super, super hard, right? The last time that we faced this on a general level was the blitz. All those decisions that people had to make about whether they were going to keep their kids in London or whether their kids were going to get sent off to the countryside to get raised by some wicked aunt. Yes. It's that sort of decision making because it's existential risk with imperfect information in a position where, you know, the difference between life or death could be minutes. Um, whew, it's a hard one, isn't it? It is a hard one. So you're, you're emphasizing just how strong it's going to be. Um, how strong it's going to be and how specific the skills required to deal with those risks are. Yes. Right? Saying no when somebody endangers your life is a hard thing because it doesn't seem like what they're doing is dangerous, but it super is. Yeah. People that have had transplants and their own immunosuppressants have to teach their friends not to come and visit if their friends are feeling even slightly ill. Because mm. if you make a mistake, it kills you. And that sort of thinking is very hard to communicate to people but now everybody's at the same kind of risks. So we have to take the mental models that we've got that are close to the situation that we're in, and we have to bring those mental models into consciousness and into currency. You know, it's kind of like the blitz and you have to decide whether you're staying in town or getting bombed uh, or leaving, right? It's kind of like a medical drama where the patient could die of a sneeze and you have to make sure that nobody else is anywhere close to them. Mm. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, any kind of drama where there's a real risk and if something goes wrong, people get hurt. It's all of those kind of templates and prototypes that are in our culture, they're in our television, they're in our mythologies. Those things have gone from being stories about other people's problems to being helpful mental templates that we can unpack and apply to the situation we're all now in. Yeah. Power of stories, right? Mm -hmm. The only access that we've got to models for handling this are things that we've seen on TV. And I can easily imagine older people that have seen, you know, 40 years of televised medical drama have a pretty good model of what infection control looks like baked into their unconscious. They uh, just they just have to realize that that is the right template. Right. Uh, is this the time to start talking about the, the timeline? Um, like just starting from now, why is right now the, such a, a crisis? You know, mm -hmm. talking about the NHS becoming overwhelmed. And then stretching out over three months, then six months, which is like November time, and then moving towards a vaccine. Yeah. So right now we've got some tricky questions about how this unfolds. Yes. So with people sort of pattering around their business and doing what they're doing, the doubling rate is something like every three days, every six days. If we start really seriously keeping people away from each other. No public events, cafes are closed, uh, bars are closed, no sporting events, schools are closed, most workplaces are work from home, strong infection control, you know, hand sanitizer, mask, all the rest of that stuff in things like food delivery jobs. If we really go down that track in a serious way, um, what we've seen from China is that first the infection can be slowed and then the infection can be stopped. So in China, they got on top of this by quarantining, I want to say 700 million people were confined to their homes. And you had a sort of hall pass system where you could go out twice a week to buy food kind of levels of control. I haven't seen a good write-up of exactly the procedures and they may have varied from area of China to area of China, but it was that level of intrusiveness. Uh, I believe in some places masks were compulsory if you were outdoors. 
they really seriously restructured the entire society to stop the contagion and did. Right? Now, if we adopt that model, it will very likely work for us too. We have a bit less of the kind of discipline and control that the Chinese have. We have a bit less of the sheer degree of organization required to pull that stuff off, as you might have noticed from things like <coughs> Brexit. Um, but the uh, bottom line is that if we take that path, it will likely slow the infection down substantially. Right? And you think, well, that's good, right? The problem is that there is every probability that this thing will take off like a rocket in winter. Right? So all the same things that tend to cause flus to spread much more quickly in winter than in summer probably also apply to coronaviruses, although again, we don't know. And in that event, you could go from it doubling kind of sort of every three days or every six days in the wild as it stands to even faster infection, totally explosive. You turned around one day and half your population got it last weekend, kind of levels of risk. Now, this is a thing that we just don't know. Right. In all probability, as summer comes on and it's hotter and drier and there's a lot more ultraviolet light in the sky, it will tend to reduce the rate of infection. Oh yeah, so, so current knowledge is uh, apparently UV light, extended uh, UV light hurts the, the virus. And I'd certainly expect that to be true. Yeah. Right? You know, humidity, high temperature, probably also, there's bunches of things. But... What that means is we might get a period where we do a bunch of infection control stuff now and we basically sort of bluff it out till May. Mm -hmm. June, July, August, September, it's okay. October, November, suddenly it comes back with an enormous wallop. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a bit of analysis online um, you know, of people modeling that stuff out and it looks pretty credible. Then you say, but that gives us six months to figure out uh, cures, uh, vaccines. Yeah. other possible protocols. Or, or yeah, be 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 better treatments. Better treatments, right? And it also gives us six months to run like really serious clinical research on exactly how to manage risk in terms of contamination, redesign or production of new classes of equipment for helping people. Mm -hmm. Like you can easily imagine, you know, a sort of standard item that you can buy in stores is kind of like a cape with gloves and a face visor that comes down to your ankles and it's really easy to get off and on because it's got magnetic fastenings up the back, mm -hmm. right? That could be mass produced. We could check whether something like that is clinically effective. We could do a bunch of tests where you put some, uh, you know, dye or something like that into a situation. You have people do a bunch of jobs and then you figure out whether there's any dye under the suit. Mm -hmm. Are they contaminated? So it would give us mass, you know, the ability to mass produce things like that where you just, you know, pull open the magnets, step into the thing, shake it so the magnets all click to each other down the back go outside, do your thing, come back, you know, and then you just kind of pop the magnets on the back, turn it inside out, hang it on a hook, you okay. know, yes. whatever it so was. There's, there's six months of uh, everyone's working on this. There's six months of everyone's working on this. And at the end of that, if we've got results, you know, chloroquine might work, uh, you know, there are a bunch of antivirals that might oh, work. Yeah. So this, this is in the last couple of days, there have been news reports that some pre-existing uh, drugs, like anti-malarial drugs and all sorts of strange things, yeah. seem to actually work rather than they actually work. Do you want the good news or the bad news? Okay. Um, doctor is very frightened. Doctor gives some random thing to a bunch of people. Half yeah. of those people survive. Yeah. Maybe it's the drug. Right? Yeah, maybe. So if that's done 500 times, mm -hmm. One time in 50, all of them will recover, and you think it was the drug. Right. Yeah. Right? And the problem is that you did lots and lots and lots of trials with no results, and one of them randomly had results, and now you think the drug is great. Okay. So early days is what you're saying. This is Not why... enough data. It's why we don't do clinical trials that way. Yeah. Right? So I'm looking at these things like, you know, like the, the, the chloroquine thing, I'm sort of looking at that like, and you tell me this affects viruses? Did anybody know it did that before? Because it's mm. for malaria normally. And, you know, there's that sort of the slight scowl of like, hmm, hmm, that would be interesting. Do I believe it? Mm, you know, jury's out, right? It doesn't quite task the smell test. Whereas when people say we've got an existing antiviral that we've developed for a bowl and it seems to work on this too, that's a little easier for me to believe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what is this? It's a hunch. The hell is going to happen? We don't know. That's why we have statisticians, right? Yes. So... If we make the bet that we basically try and keep a lid on it hard now, 
the summer helps us out. We work like demons over the summer to figure out some way of controlling it. And then when winter comes back, we're ready. Maybe this works. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it doesn't slow up much in summer, right, or it hits us super hard between now and summer, which looks entirely credible, then we've got a whole bunch of other problems, right? And the people that are doing this stuff for a living are sweating blood right now. Oh my God, can you imagine the responsibility? UK government announces this herd immunity thing. The entire internet gets out spreadsheets and starts screaming. The UK government, to their credit, by the way, walks it back immediately mm -hmm. and apparently are going to come up with another plan. Well, okay, actually, I'm glad you guys walked it back because if you'd stuck to that, it would have been really nightmarish. So... Then we get to this level of, like, okay, so the government is doing all of this malarkey, but people get the infection one at a time, mm -hmm. right? So if you're retired and you have the ability to stay at home, this is great. Now we have to talk about the really hard case, the thing that really sucks. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. Right. Right? Lots of old folks have Alzheimer's. Lots of old folks have other continuous care um, uh, uh, diseases, disabilities, whatever it happens to be. How hard are these people going to get hit? They're going to get hit hard. Why are they going to get hit hard? Because they've already gotten hit hard. The most vulnerable are the most vulnerable. When things get worse, they're disproportionately badly affected. So if you think of the situation where you've got, you know, two elderly people living together, one of whom has mild Alzheimer's and the other of whom has become a full-time carer, mm -hmm. their fragility in the face of this is absolutely massive. Because the resources which could be used to do comprehensive adaptation are currently being used to taking care of the ill partner. Mm. So, you know, if you were two pretty healthy, pretty wealthy old folks that, you know, live in Range Rover country, uh, Land Rover country rather, and, you know, have, you know, two dogs and a gardener, you tell the gardener not to come to the work and, you know, everything else you just deal with, right? But if you're in this position where you're jammed right up against this already, where do you get the time and the energy and the money to make the adaptation steps? Mm -hmm. And I don't see anything like the level of freaking out about this that there needs to be in order to get somebody to step in and deal with this. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the Alzheimer's. There's a range of problems that we have here. Um, for younger people, I don't see any real discussion about mental health impact. Mm -hmm. You know, All those folks who are out there who are already clinically depressed and may or may not be on medication, suddenly the world around you turns completely to shit. Are we seeing a spike in suicides? Will we see a spike in suicides? Could anything be done to prevent that? So every group of fragile or disenfranchised people are in a position where they're kind of having to push for their own survival, and they may not have a lot to push with. And as a society, the question is, how much duty of care are we actually going to honour relative to these citizens? And... I don't really see the kind of push that it would take to get that done because the people that are most important and most able, which is the doctors and nurses and uh, associated support staff inside of the NHS, are getting bugger all support already and that's only going to increase. Mm. See what I'm saying? So, and we haven't even talked about the, you know, running out of intensive care beds and all the rest of that. I think everybody's probably heard that story. Okay. But... You know, bottom line is the NHS will saturate because they just won't have any more of the equipment required to handle um, people with extreme breathing problems because that equipment is not easy to manufacture in a hurry and we don't have nearly enough of it to handle a pandemic, which is not anybody's fault. We didn't know it would be respiratory. You know, it could have been something else. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we are in this position where people are beginning to use the T word. Triage. Mm. Right? Help the people that are most likely to survive if you give them help. Ignore the ones who will probably die regardless of what you do. That sort of thinking is statistically um, impossible to deny, but it's also the kind of thing which is culturally incredibly destructive. Um, so let's go back to your parents. Right? They live in a house. Mm -hmm. There's just the two of them. Mm -hmm. They're currently doing a lot more wandering around outside than you're comfortable with. Mm. Um, they're reasonably middle class and they've got access to food delivery services while those are still running. Mm -hmm. It's a question of persuading them to stay home, getting their electronics sorted out so they can talk to all their you know friends, neighbours, relatives, etc. Mm -hmm. 
getting the food delivery arrangements sorted out so they understand how to get stuff into their house without getting contaminated and making sure that they've got masks, gloves, some kind of plastic poncho type thing and uh, some kind of spray disinfectant mm. um, so that if they do have to interact with the outside world they've got a reasonable degree of protection around them mm -hmm. and then when they get home you know they have to basically be able to spray that stuff down in such a way that they don't get contaminated deal with the whole question that way um it is not an easy time to be young and it's a really not easy time to be old um and those procedural measures like you know you, you take our elevator right mm -hmm. so if somebody goes up to the seventh floor with a hacking cough in that elevator and then i get one at the ninth floor and some of that you know particulate matter settles in my eyeball one in ten chance of dying maybe mm -hmm. maybe it's one in five right um i'm not used to running those kind of risks mm. right i mean you know there, there have been times in my life when i did really insanely dangerous things right riding freight trains oh you know you slip under a train you lose your legs and mm. then you die um uh, but you know like i wasn't planning on running those kind of risks this year mm -hmm. and now i kind of look at that elevator like wow so if i'm dealing with that elevator you know, okay, one in 500, 50, 50 chance somebody in the building has it right now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. These aren't good odds already. <clears throat> so I'm beginning to look at that elevator as a bit of a death trap, which is why if I'm going to be getting into that elevator from now on, it's going to be full moon suit, right? The wellies, the cape, the gloves, right? The face shield, the mask. Is that as good as I can do? Probably. Maybe I want to add a pair of glasses to that as well. Maybe even goggles, but you sort of assemble by degrees <clears throat> an accurate risk model of the situation. Mm -hmm. And the accurate risk model of the situation today will be so different to the accurate risk model in a month that my recommendation is that people start basically, you know, dress rehearsals for the main production because the dress rehearsals are protective and when we get to main production, they will keep you vastly safer. And main production is a few weeks. Mm. Did that answer your questions? I feel like I've rambled enormously. Um, it's, it's been uh, quite a chunk, but then a lot of it is just building up a, a sense of what the world model is, which is mostly just talking around the subject. Yeah. Um, you did get around to, you know, this, this is what the, th there is a real threat. This is what the threat is. Mm -hmm. These are the best um, ideas that we have for mitigating or minimizing that risk, starting with just never going out. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, as, as much protection as you possibly can. Um, I mean, I guess, uh, what are we doing? So we've, we've got up to sort of November. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, we, sh we should wrap this up soon. Um, yeah, so basically the winter could be bad again. Winter could be bad again. <clears throat> but we've got enormous amounts of time to get oriented and managed by then. Yeah. I would expect a lot of very, very strong international cooperation on a number of fronts to get built out between now and then. <clears throat> um, and if you think of this as being like one sprint from here to the wall, the weather gets warm, mm. and then another sprint over the summer, and then, <clears throat> you know, the real kind of Helm's Deep Trench warfare experience begins in winter. Yeah. That is probably 50-50 how it's going to go. Mm. Right? But of course, when it's summer here, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere, so they might be about to get completely clobbered. Like you might see places like New Zealand become Italy. Yes. Um, and that then questions, are we going to have air travel come back? Are we not going to have air travel come back? What do we do with all the people that are stranded in various places? Yep. You know, it's, it's just going to be a total, total, total mess right the way here forward. Um. Yeah, so that's re-emphasizing re the point that, you know, there was before this virus and then there's after this virus. Yeah, that's right. And then there's during. Yeah. Um, so the, the last thing, or there are two things. Let me knock these off quickly. So I don't expect to see problems with power, with gas, with telecommunications, with grid services, or with bulk food logistics. Mm -hmm. 
I do expect food delivery problems in rural areas, I expect, and I expect an enormously narrowed range of material available from places like Amazon. Mm -hmm. I think shops will largely stay open, but on very, very careful terms. Like it might be that you can't come into the shop if you don't have mask and gloves on, I don't really know. Mm. But I don't get the sense that it's going to cave in those kind of infrastructures. The financial system, I think, is probably toast. And we're going to wind up with a kind of wartime command economy in a lot of places. The Americans are already dropping, talking about airdropping $1,000 to every single American right now just so they can buy supplies and manage risk. Mm. That's unprecedented. Yes. Um, and I think that we should consider that that might be more than Donald Trump attempting to buy an election. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the, the unprecedented net, that is, I mean, I guess that's, it, it seems like socialism and in America and with, where they, they, they regard that as basically Satan um, with a Republican populist president. It, 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 that's how unprecedented it is. It's weird. It's weird. Do you know the term only Nixon could go to China? Uh, yes. Yeah. Not a, not a common term in the UK. You know, Richard Nixon was an ultra hard line right wing American president and he could go to China because he wasn't seen as making concessions to the Chinese. Possibly only Donald Trump could usher in basic income. Mm -hmm. Right? Because he's, you know, unimpeachably hard. And if an unimpeachably hard man says the federal government needs to give you money because it's good for the federal government and good for America, well, maybe you take it. Because mm -hmm. goodness knows he's not doing it because it's good for the ordinary American poor person, right? It has to be national interest. So I don't know how they're going to frame it. Maybe they'll make the national interest, or however they're doing it. Sorry, I'm rambling. So that's point one. Point two is really the fiddly part, right? So... There is a trade-off in people's minds between psychological and emotional pain and physical risk, mm -hmm. right? If you are a little old lady and you're in your, let's say, 90s, right? And your family that lived in Australia have just had a new grandkid and they've just flown back to the UK. How much risk is it worth to see your children and the grandchild? Mm-hmm. Right, it might be a great grandchild at 90, but you see what I'm saying, right? You know, you are sort of thinking, well, look, I've only got a few years left to live, even best case. It's super important for me to see the great grandchildren because let's say it's the first great grandchild. Um, and I know that there is a risk that I'm going to catch, you know, the bug off these folks because we don't have effective testing and so on. Right? So one answer is that you take the risk and you just do it. The other answer is that you wait it out until we've got testing, we've got the infection under control, risk is managed, people have been quarantined, you make you trust that you'll get a chance to do it later. Mm -hmm. That approach of just hold on till summer when everything settles down and we've got our game together is probably not unwise, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're wrong, you've missed out a life opportunity, and if you're right, you get to do it in a way which is safe. Yeah. Right? Because in all of these situations, we don't know what is right, we only know what is safe. So better to do fail on the side of safety than fail on the side of dying. Mm. Even worse, killing the people you care about. The other side of this is the inconvenience of like, you know, you've got two old people who are taking care of a teenager and the teenager just won't stop sneaking out to have a quick spliff with their mates, mm -hmm. right? And now you really have a problem because you're going to kick this kid out on the street because they won't comply with the infection control, even though it's not putting them in any danger, and it, but it is putting you in danger. How do we handle that, right? Do you move the kid into the garage, right? Okay, you're not allowed in the house anymore, go to the garage. Do you kick them out entirely? Do you try and argue with them to get them to do the right thing? A lot of people are going to die unnecessarily because they aren't able to have a clean, clear conversation about risk, mm. right? This behavior could get me killed and you have to stop it. Well, look, I can't live without having a life because you guys were in danger of catching some flu and seizing yourself to death. What are we going to do about this? And I think that that intergenerational conflict about how severe we are with the pandemic management is not going to be done in the same way that it wasn't done in Germany, uh, sorry, in uh, Japan and in China. <clears throat> because here we have a different social contract between the generations and also between us and the government. Mm. So in China, the government stepped into that, laid down the law, and that was the end of the story for everybody. Here, I think we're going to be left with much more of this being up to individuals and getting high-quality decision-making in emotionally difficult situations with death on the line is basically what almost all drama is about in TV. 
right? That's all your cop shows, it's all your historical dramas, it's all your war movies. It's always that point where you have to have a difficult emotional conversation before people can figure out how to keep each other safe or if they're going their separate ways. Yeah. And I feel like that's going to be replicated in households all over the world in a really, really rough way. But if we don't have those conversations, people are just going to keep calm and carry on and then they're going to die. So unfortunately, the time has come for the difficult conversations universally. And then we have to take it from there. Yeah. Hard days. Um, yes, but clear, um, clear things to do. Queer things to do. I mean, you know, uh, because as you said, at the start, we cannot uh, control the virus. It's just that that, that's what's happening now. So therefore, how do we react um, as we do those things? And and I think we have to be really clear that young people are are on available data at relatively minimal risk. Yeah. Right. So if we reorganize carefully, where we take the survivors that are mostly immune, almost entirely immune, I expect, but we'll wait for clinical data, if we have young people doing the majority of the functions that require young people energy and minimal risk and so on and henceforth, I think we can reorganize, like, you know, if you take all of the older drivers out of circulation in taxis and Ubers and bus drivers, Mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, if you're over 35, you're not doing these jobs anymore, and you glove up and all the rest of that stuff, and you, you know, have healthcare workers who come through and spray everything down every half an hour, and you finally figure out the mask thing, and, you know, like... There is a certain amount of, you know, keep calm and carry on that you can do as long as you do your homework first. Yeah. And it's not unimaginable to me at all that we will succeed in doing that because we're not actually stupid. We can make this kind of thing work, but we need a little time to orient and it would be a real shame for people to unnecessarily get killed by making a bunch of what would be later clearly seen as errors before we've all gotten oriented. Mm. So my advice is, over caution now, just stay away from people, nail everything down, wait for society to get oriented, wait for the summer, wait for the vaccines, stay alive until the situation gets better. And that does require carrying some emotional burden and some emotional pain now for all of the generations that have to collaborate to make this work. Okay, shall we, shall we wrap it up then? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. <laughs>